Hello guys, Perry Nemiroff here, and I'm back with another exclusive Collider Videos interview. This one is an extra special one. It's a movie that I'm really excited about. It is definitely one of my favorite movies of 2016, and I'm not just saying it because the writer and executive producer is sitting here with me. We have Eric Heiser here. Eric, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. If you couldn't tell, the large majority of the people in this office are very, very excited about your movie. <laughs> it's incredible. Thank you. Uh, before we actually discuss the writing and the making of this movie, I have a yeah. very important question that everybody in the office is constantly being asked and we get a lot of crap for it. Uh -oh. I want you to tell me the name of the director of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, Denis Villeneuve. Denis Villeneuve. Yes. Because we get some comments that say, you're supposed to say, Denis Villeneuve, <laughs> like with an R. Maybe. It, I, I don't have an I will accent, tell you so. that like people still have arguments and they've been on set with the man. So okay. it, you know, you, this is one of those things that, that will always be like the Schrodinger's cat of this, of this <laughs> particular uh, filmmaker. Well, you said it. So Denis Villeneuve for me from now on. There it is. I'm glad we've got that settled. I'm the one that'll get you in trouble. <laughs> okay. I'm always going to blame you. Great. Um, so just backtracking a bit before arrival. I've been following your career because I'm, I'm a big horror fan. So, you know, you burst on the scene with A Nightmare on Elm Street. And I would say that you have made strides in the horror genre every step of the way. I'm a big Final Destination fan as well. How do you go from movies like that and kind of wind up here? Does someone give you this material because they think it suits you? Because I don't really compare Arrival to those two very well. No, the answer is no. The answer <laughs> is I was just getting one broken horror movie after another. And, uh, you know, and I grew up at a time when writers were never monogamous to one genre, you know, considering that I did the prequel to the thing. Uh, Bill Lancaster wrote John Carpenter's film back in 82, uh, or the 82 release, and he also wrote The Bad News Bears. And I, you know, I, I love all kinds of genre, and I broke into this business with a horror f a script, but it was one of 12 that I had written, and mm -hmm. none of the others were horror. I was so excited about to get back to sci-fi. But you have to prove yourself. Once you're in a lane, you have to prove you can train. You know, you can transfer to another lane. So I had to do that. Well, I'm very glad you did prove yourself and get here because this is this is just an excellent script. Can you tell me about working with Ted Chiang's source material? Because I was reading the press notes and I found it interesting that he had said, I believe, that he couldn't visualize this as a movie at first. This is true. Uh, I had been carrying around his stories for a long time, and I was particularly obsessed with Story of Your Life. Uh, I was desperate to try and make it a movie, mainly because Ted often pulls a magic trick in his in his writing where he hits you with some very heady scientific concepts and and sort of educates you, and then he hits you in the heart. And I love stories and films that appeal to both the mind and the heart. So I thought, if I could make this work in a film, then it'd be a victory, especially if it was a way to draw more people back to Ted's original story. And I didn't realize how hard it would be to turn it into a cinematic experience, but uh, I was up to the task. And we tried at first to pitch this around to all the studios, and, we, and everybody said no, uh, which was interesting, especially because some of the no people who said no were like, well, if you turn the lead into a man, maybe we'll, we'll do something. Uh, or, you know, if you- Was that sigh loud enough? Sorry, <laughs> I don't think it was. And, and, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to make it was because of you know the the female lead with this so we held all the cards and that was the lovely thing about it uh i had to say though i wanted to write this on spec i wanted to do this on my own and deliver the script to show them what i meant and that meant getting uh, a longer option on the material from ted so the first time i really had to speak to him was to convince him to give me the rights for it and that was the most nerve-wracking pitch call i've ever had it really was it was a little bit like me telling ted you know so i'm gonna borrow your kid <laughs> We're going to go out for a long weekend, we'll come back, he'll have learned some new words, he'll probably look a little different, you know, it was that kind of thing. And thankfully, um, when I started talking about how I saw the way to make it cinematic and diverge from the source material in a few key ways, he was all right with it. Was there any, like, key to, or would you say there was any moment where you broke story? I guess the, the biggest change, and the one that had a large ripple effect through the rest of the film, was having the heptapods, having the aliens arrive on Earth, having them show up here at a front door. That was not something that was in the original short story. And that sort of created a ripple that all the other changes came from. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I was also, uh, I was looking at your, your Twitter to prepare for this interview, and I saw that you had tweeted a picture, I believe with the production designer, 
And yes. you, had, you had credited the production designer with changing the heptapod written language. What, right. what did your original version of that look like? Well, okay, now I got uh, really frustrated with myself during the writing of the script because I, every time I tried to describe in words what this language looked like, I got very dissatisfied, I got frustrated, and I wound up getting longer and longer. And the last thing you want in a script is to write a novel. You're not a novelist here. You, know, you gotta go for like haiku. You gotta find a poetry to it. Uh, and I couldn't. I just would end up using too many words, and I was complaining to my wife about this this one night and I said I just I don't know what to do and she said show me what are you talking about draw for me and I scrawled this circular logogram and it had some curls and some extra pieces and I said something like that and she said well there you go just put that in it and I said you can't wait can you do that can you actually uh, and I discovered that no actually Final Draft and the other screenwriting software at the time didn't allow you to insert <laughs> graphics so I took that I'm a very stubborn guy let me tell you I kind of took that as dare and said, well, fine. And you know, converted it to PDF and then manually inserted, I think it did five or six different logograms and showed visually what I was talking about hmm. in the script. You know, I just created space in the original document uh, and then discovered that I had to do that manually every time I had a new draft. I did that way too much. Oh boy. <laughs> this is a movie in particular where I would imagine it's hard to put the visual references that you need to see on screen on the page but yeah. you kind of do have to translate for the director and for everyone else involved like a production designer exactly what you mean right yeah it's, it's difficult in this situation it is i mean it got to the point where i was considering hiring like a storyboard artist and a concept artist to go along with this and uh at, at that point in time Thankfully, I had producers that were with me to like gently say, it's all right, put that away. You're okay. We'll, we'll figure this out from here. Did a lot change from script to screen? Not really. I mean, there were some, a few major changes that had to happen either because, um, you know, uh, we had to deal with Interstellar and there were some, some mm -hmm. concepts that uh, early versions of our story overlapped with that. Uh, and so we had to make a couple of course corrections. But it n really the spinal column of the story never changed. And I, I, honestly, the first five pages of the script uh, are, were the same from the first draft on. Hmm. Did you learn anything from Interstellar too? Because I, I do like that movie. I greatly appreciate it. But I think you do something better than what that movie tried to do in a way. Can you reference movies like Interstellar and other sci-fi movies and be like, all right, they did it this way. This is how we need to do, do it to make it better. I was always emotionally drawn to Close Encounters. Mm -hmm. That was one of my favorite films uh, growing up. And maybe my favorite Spielberg film ever. Uh, you know, so that was my influence. By and large, though, I tried my best to stick to, to Ted's story mm -hmm. and, the, and draw inspiration from that and from him. Um, and not so much from Interstellar or other movies. Yeah. You, know, you try your best to try and make a new thing and not have it taste like something else. Which is what makes this such a special movie. I mean, you got to have a pretty daring group of people to put their resources into something like this because it, we, we just posted our review of the movie on the channel. And oh. we, we said in our review, you know, this is an alien invasion movie. You can definitely call it that. But hold your horses, guys. There's, <sighs> there's not the same level of action. And it's, it's not the same type of content. No. So it's it's impressive to pull that off, and I think you you needed to you needed to have the full control your way in order to make this work, and it worked pretty damn well. <laughs> Thank you. Was test screening a big part of this process? Because this is a movie. As a moviegoer, I tend to look for things with I like rules and I like logic, and I like to be able to say that happened because of that. You can't really play this game with this script. So I was very surprised that I walked out as satisfied as I was with what I got without completely understanding what I got at the same time. And yeah. I kind of grew to appreciate that. So what was the test screening process like? What were you looking for out of those? Well, we wanted to see how many people were really emotionally affected by it, uh, even if they didn't understand all mm -hmm. of it. Um, and the confusion from the early test screenings were certainly, you know, that feedback was part of the, part of the process. But there's how to say this, this story, this film is a bit like building a boat inside a bottle and you'd be very careful uh, with the way that it was constructed. You can't just over clarify something or oversimplify something. You can't have a, just a mountain of exposition. We didn't want a $40 million Ted talk 
and and we also didn't want to talk down to our audience. I never like get condescending. Having been around really smart people, scientists and linguists and other consultants that we used to make sure that this film was authentic, the way that they talk to each other is never like whoa, speak English, doc. You know, we never get to that. Um, so it was about doing our best to preserve uh, the telling of a story that was basically two plus two and not saying four. That's a good approach to it. I, I think you succeeded in that respect. How much of the alien language did you develop beyond what we see in the movie? Because that's, that's one of the most fascinating parts to me. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about the design of the language before. Right. I look at that and I kind of see a work of art that I'd probably hang on my... I, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised, actually, if people saw this movie and wound up getting tattoos. Right. Well, yeah. I am. Yeah. You're, I, you, I'm absolutely going to really? get a tattoo. Yeah. What, what word are you going to get tattooed? Uh, time. Time? Yes. Oh, I like that. But uh, I can tell you that it really... The lovely thing about this film is that the script was kind of a springboard in a lot of things. I could, I could take it only so far. Um, and then with Denis curating all the right people for it, he brought everybody on to, to make the same film. And that's such a crazy distinction I need to make here. But if you have someone who, who's just trying to make either a straightforward action movie or a you know, crazy conspiracy thriller or something else while you're, while you're trying to do something um, true to what it was originally meant to do, you end up with something that's a little more convoluted. And he found everybody who knew what this story was, who knew what this movie was, and knew how to then improve it. So he got a production designer by the name of Patrice Vermette, and he and, and his wife began tackling the idea of building a legitimate alien language. Uh, he took my little circular logo rams from the screenplay and he was like, that's a good kid. You, you, got, you did your part. I'm going to take it from here. And created a, a much more organic and authentic language that is actually legitimate. It's a hundred different logograms, a hundred different pieces that form a complete language. He created an alphabet in, in Heptapod in a way that I didn't even uh, realize. And we had another amazing man by the name of Stephen Wolfram uh, uh, who loaned his software for some of this. And when he discovered how much work that Patrice had, had done on this language, then coded some software to help analyze and, and uh, codify that, that language, all those logograms. So there is a scene in this film where you're seeing on a, on a software, like uh, on a screen, mm -hmm. the software like decoding different words within a phrase on this alien language, and that is actually happening. That's not just some CGI sequence. That's actually software at work. Oh, that's crazy. And what about the, uh, the heptapods themselves? How did that change from what you originally envisioned to what we see in the final cut of the film? I started with the description that I got that was a little vague from Ted Chang in the story. Uh, who described a, a creature that had no front or back, so you had a better, better sense of the fact that they didn't think in a start-to-finish kind of mm -hmm. way. And, and it built into their written language a bit more. But then at some point in time, Denis and I realized we had to give something to the visual effects artists to look at in terms of how these things moved and you know, what was their behavior like. And to do that, you had to look for you know, visual resources here. And he and I went down the rabbit hole on brand new deep sea aquatic life that people had started to discover. And we found some interesting, very sort of like squid-like things that Denim in particular was fascinated by. And he used some of those as just to behaviors to, to modify or to, to use as a model. Uh, what I thought was interesting from that was I have a very HP Lovecraft like fanboy head and so when I started to see those I got scared I was like oh this is bad they're here to take us over they're elder gods run away and and that actually helps the whole story because it it's all about not getting a clear sense of communication at the front and mm -hmm. making the false assumptions and misinterpretations that's really one of the core themes we play with and now in the movie we focus on this one pair of heptapods there are 12 ships that land, so just out of curiosity, we do get a sense of what went on in certain other areas, but do you yourself, just as a screenwriter of this material, know what went on or have a general idea of what went on in some of those other locations? I wrote a lot of what went on in those other locations, mm. you know? We had the, the, the Hokkaido site, they had four cello players trying different musical uh, accompaniments and arrangements to see if that would work. You know, we had someone that used uh, entirely different a uh, set of, of uh, oh, sign language. That was another one. Huh. Someone tried sign language with them. Painting. 
someone tried just uh, bringing in different machines to see if there was some sort of mechanistic connection. This would be such a great companion piece. <laughs> I love like a featurette on this or something. Yeah, yeah. There's a. I could ramble for a long time. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, I could ramble about this movie forever, but we're we're almost about out of time. Okay. I needed to throw in one question for myself. Okay. Every, we're talking about a movie that's going to get so much awards, but I have to. I don't want to jinx you, but I I think this is going to have a very healthy life in the coming months, where we're going to be celebrating all of these great achievements, but. For me, myself, no one else is going to care about this, but having worked on Final Destination 5, that movie comes to a close. Has there been any talk about doing another one? Because the way that movie wraps up as a hardcore fan of that franchise is pretty damn brilliant. Thank you. I mean, that was my love letter to fans because I was a huge fan of the first film. Received. Good. I love that. Um, I can say that if there is... Any plan mm -hmm. for that? Um, they haven't called me yet. I got ideas. You do? I got All right. Ideas. I'm going to have them call you. Okay. Please please have them call me. Did you well, ever see the... I'm still obsessed with this. The uh, I think it was a fan-made trailer where it was Final Destination, The Dark Ages. Oh. And it was like way back in the... I thought that was brilliant. Oh, oh that's cool. Isn't it? I thought that's it was cool, cool. too. All right. Now, now I feel better about myself. Thank you guys for bearing with me. Eric, thank you so much for coming in. Again, I cannot congratulate you enough on this movie. It real something special that I'm going to take with me well beyond 2016. So huge congratulations to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right, guys. So I hope you got the message at this point. Please go see Arrival. It comes out in theaters nationwide on Friday, November 11th. It is a must see. That's all the time we got for you today. Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.